So joining me tonight on the phone is Dr. Mario Martinez. Dr. Martinez is a pioneering neuropsychologist and a best-selling author of The Mind-Body Code. You know, he lectures around the world on how cultural uh, beliefs affect health and longevity. You know, he's also the founder of the Biocognitive Science and he's working in the intersection of culture, psychology, wellness, and longevity. Wonderful to have you on this evening, Dr. Mario Martinez. How are you doing? Doing well. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm glad to have you with us. So go on and tell us a little bit about biocognitive science. Tell us a little bit about what that means. <clears throat> well, briefly what it means is that uh, mind and body are connected, and the mind can affect the body. But what, is, what affects the mind and what affects the mind is the culture. We live in a culture, and it, it's belief systems that we share. And those belief systems are incorporated into the body, and they actually create biology. Okay, that's awesome. So that makes total sense. So this goes completely on lines of what we're talking about this evening because, you know, I've been talking about how when people are, you know, surrounded environmentally, um, when they're brought up with certain beliefs, um, it, it changes the way that you look at, you know, your outlook on, the, on life. And so sometimes when we start making our own decisions or maybe changing our beliefs or making, you know, kind of like easy decisions saying, you know, I don't really accept this in my life, it can be hard to kind of get past that initial situation. But once you make the change, it can also be a little scary after. But once you continue to do this, you're on the road to kind of a different life. Yes, and, and I, what I do is I try to bring anthropology into neuroscience, and, and there's a great concept in, in anthropology called hegemony, and what it means is that you incorporate a belief system so implicitly that you don't even know that there's another reality. So you, you live out that reality as if there were that the reality rather than just a reality that was imposed on you by the cultural history that, that you were exposed to. I like that. So you create your own reality. Yes. And based on your, on your cultural beliefs and, and, the, and the culture that you come from. And, and I'll give you a real simple example. <clears throat> in uh, in uh, Peru, they consider the uh, hot flashes, they, consider, they call it bochorno, which is a word for shame. And we know now that the immune system responds to shame with inflammation. It causes inflammation. So the women in Peru, when they have the, the hot flashes, they have more inflammation than women in Japan who consider the hot flashes uh, moving into the second spring or a place of wisdom for the woman. So you see the culture shapes the biology. Wow. So in one case, somebody feels shameful and feels even worse about having what they have. And in the other case, somebody feels fruitful and feels uh, even, even, even better about the situation. Yes, and they have less inflammation in the body. So you see, it's, it's a correlate that the body responds to the culture rather than the other way around. That's awesome. I mean, and that's true. It's like our beliefs can really dictate a lot of things. And like simply put, I like that what you said. And also it's like even day to day our thoughts. I mean, if we believe that we're not if if you believe in, in inside your inside your body that you're not worth it, you're not worthy, then you're you're never going to be yeah. worthy. Yes, and I think that that unfortunately a lot of the, the new age uh um Sciences that not even science, but you know books that they tell you have good thoughts and everything's going to be okay. It doesn't work because if you have a belief system of un, uh, system of unworthiness, you could tell yourself all day that you're a good person and your biology is not going to buy it, and you're going to continue to sabotage yourself. Explain that a little bit more. Well, what happens is that we we build a a, a worthiness based on what we're told about ourselves. For example, if you're shamed as a, as a, as a child. You're going to have an unworthiness. You're going to have an unworthiness about you that no matter what you do in your life, no matter what you accomplish, it's not enough because the, the framework, the belief system that you have is that you're unworthy. So therefore, if you tell yourself that you're worthy, if you see things that are worthy, if you see, uh, for example, um, rock stars and people that, that, that are loved by millions, some are self-destructive because they don't believe it. They, the information that comes in, it's like, yes, a lot of people love me, but if they really knew who I am, they wouldn't really love me. So you see, it's a, it's a belief system that you carry independent of the feedback that you get. I understand that. That's interesting. We were just talking about Justin Bieber earlier in the first segment. Um, you know, I also wondered about this, you know, because I always think about how family, you know, you're raised by whoever, if it was your mom, your dad, your grandparents, if you were adopted, whatever. And um, sometimes, you know, you can have like a blind side to something. So let's say like your family, let's say your family was never there. They were really absent. Uh, they, they spent very minimal time with you. 
you could have a blind side to that situation in your in the future. So if somebody's around in your life and they seem to be absent a lot, you'll either have a blind side to that, just kind of accept it, or you might get very angry about it. Well, yeah, what happens in that case, uh, there are three archetypal wounds in my theory, but um, that, that, that wound is abandonment. What happens is that since you're, you learn that, that abandonment from somebody that you love, you entangle abandonment with love, and the only way that you can love or be loved is by abandonment. This is why people will say, I've been married three times and I've been abandoned three times. Well, what happens is you, you, you learn a language and you speak it fluently, and that's all you can do. So what we try to do in biocognition is to untangle the wound from the love so the love can be pristine rather than entangled with the wound. Yeah, so exactly. So what he's saying, guys, is like if you're always equating uh, abandonment um, or pain with what is love, then you're going to constantly get abandonment or you're going to constantly get pain. You're never going to get like what yeah, really exactly. love is. Of course, but you know, a lot of people say no. But I really want to be loved, and I, but I really want to. I really want people to love me, but they don't realize it's, it's that what you were saying is that blind spot. They don't realize that what they're speaking is abandonment along with love, rather than love without abandonment. So what they do is they look for situations where they can abandon or be abandoned, even though intellectually they understand that it's not in their best interest. I, I, li- I like that. I also I was also thinking about the other day about how a lot of times we can be snowed, you know, to uh, to a situation. Like for example, um, let's say for example, like somebody's father maybe was was absent a lot and wasn't around, and so sometimes it, you might be snowed or kind of have a blind side to people that might be passive aggressive, not because the the father or the entity was passive aggressive, but because of that passive situation, you don't even see the aggression of those other people until it's kind of too late. Because you're kind of coping, you're having these coping skills as well. Yes, because what you learn is to speak intimacy with a component of, of abandonment. And in fact, if you have that language and you don't, you don't see abandonment, you think you're not being loved. I've had patients who have told me, I'm wondering if my uh, husband is having an affair because he hasn't beaten me up in, in three months. See, it's a language. Wow. Excuse. So how do you do, how do you, how, what's your advice on... You know, making this change of basically, you know, resurrecting somebody or actually not resurrecting, even creating and helping them actually co-create their definition of love without and, you know, non smattered with all this other disarray. Well, it's not easy because it's not an intellectual process and not like, uh, for example, if it were just intellectual, you could tell an addict, look, you're killing yourself with this cocaine. Why are you doing that? And the person would say, oh, you're right. And I'll stop. It doesn't work that way. It, it's an intimate language that the person learns. So what we what we've developed some some techniques and and as you mentioned in in, in my um, uh, mind body code uh, um, CD, I, I teach these concepts to how to how to really break away not just intellectually but in, a, in an existential way. And one of the ways to do it is that you have to change your worthiness, your sense of worthiness. If your worthiness is low, then no amount of feedback will let you know that you're worthy. Why? Because you learned that, not intellectually. You, you didn't learn to be shamed or abandoned or, or betrayed intellectually. You learned it experientially. You were able to feel the pain. And the, and the way to do that is with some contemplative methods or, or deep relaxation methods that take you back to the place and, and recontextualize. They, they, they reconstruct your concept of, of what the wound is. And then there's some healing fields. I call them healing fields, which is, for example, if you have abandonment, then you can learn a consciousness of commitment. If you have shame, you can learn a consciousness of honor. Or betrayal, you can learn a consciousness of um, loyalty. But that's done with, it's a complex process, but it doesn't take years of psychoanalysis. It's a fairly quickly way, uh, quick, quick way to deal with it because you're using the right tools. Awesome. Okay, well, we got to talk about more of that later on here in the hour. We're actually going to take a break here, and I want to keep it on 570 KLIF, so keep it on the dial. You want to keep it on iHeartRadio. So, Dr. Mario Martinez is back with us here, and, and, and Dr. Martinez, you know, I was thinking a lot about some, some options here tonight, and I like what you told us. I like the idea that we both agree with the worthiness. We both agree with the fact that if you don't feel like you're worthy, you're never going to change anything anyway, so we got to build upon that, and that is a quintessential. That's part of the Burgess 7, and that was the biggest one is about worthiness, and so... 
if you have something that you could tell our listeners about maybe how to gain ground if you're having problems feeling worthy, what are some of the things that you would build upon, some easy things that you can tell our listeners that they can start doing tonight? Okay, the, fir- the first thing is to, uh, to realize that, that if you learn something that, that doesn't serve you well anymore, it, it doesn't mean that because you're not changing, it doesn't mean that you're not smart or that you're not wanting to help yourself. What it means is that initially it had a function. Whatever you're doing that's not working for you initially had a function. And let me give you a real quick example, fibromyalgia, which is a, an illness that, that, that's almost epidemic right now. Uh, a little girl um, goes to sleep worrying that her grandfather is going to come in and, and do something to her inappropriate. It's going to touch her and so forth. So what does the little girl learn? She learns to not sleep deeply. She has to sleep lightly. That had a function. But 10 years later, the grandfather's not more, and she's continuing that hypervigilance, that uh, feeling that she can't go to sleep because there's danger. What does that do that causes fibromyalgia? the lack of sleep, the, the lack of uh, deep sleep, uh, what's called delta waves. So what happened is that in for, for her to be able to survive, for her, for her to be able to, to function, she had to be hypervigilant, but not later, no longer. So what you do is you ask yourself, how did, what I'm doing right now, what I'm, what I'm doing that I want to change, that I don't like, how did it serve me well in the beginning? Number one, so you can see the wisdom that you have. And then how is it not serving me well anymore and how can I let it go, like letting go of a friend that I've known for many years because it served me well, but it's no longer serving me well. How can I let it go? How can I give myself an opportunity to let go of something that, that feels comfortable, but it's not good for me? So it's important to see that, that there's wisdom in the initial use of what you're doing, but then it's no longer useful and you're still using it. And you invested a lot of time, a lot of emotions, a lot of uh, intellect and it's not easy. It's just like you're investing money in, in the bank, and all of a sudden they tell you that money's not good anymore, and you still want to make sure that that money's there, and you want to be able to use that money because of the investment of time and emotions. I agree with that, and it's like a lot of times it's hard to get out of a situation, especially when we are so um, ingrained with that. And a lot of times, just the idea of realizing that it's not right, or realizing the fact that I can change this, realizing the fact that okay, this is going to be tough, this is going to be really hard, this is going to be overwhelming, I'm going to feel a little out of my element, I might feel a lot out of my element, but at the same point in time, that feeling is also a good feeling, because I've realized in life when things are changing for the better, there's always that situation where you feel a little off, like you feel like you feel like things are moving so fast, you're just like trying to catch your breath, but yet it's the right thing to do. So, um... Dr. Martinez, I've really loved having you on the show this evening, and if you could leave us with uh, a lasting thought that you'd like to leave uh, our prospective listeners. Yes. Uh, one of the things that we try to, uh, to teach is that uh, it goes totally against um, the conventional wisdom in, in, uh, in, in the life sciences. We learn our illnesses, and we inherit our causes of health. That's really important to see, so I'll repeat it. We learn our illnesses, and we inherit our causes of health. That's awesome, and that is profound. And I really appreciate you coming on, Dr. Martinez, and I'd like to have you come on here in the future. Uh, So look forward to having you back on as well. And so if anybody, uh, is there a website that people can go to to get more information on you? Yes, they can go to, it's called, you, you can go, you can Google Biocognitive, or you can go to Amazon.com and, and, and um, look up uh, the Mind Body Code and you'll get all kinds of information there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mario. I appreciate you, you. And by the way, let our listeners know where you're calling in from. Oh, I'm calling from uh, Montevideo, Uruguay, South America. When I pre- it's uh, winter right now. And it's winter. It's winter there. Yeah. So, and, and the connection has been very good for all the way across there, but we really appreciate you coming on Perspectives and look forward to having you here in the future. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for your fine work. Well, thank you so much, too, and thanks for helping uh, so many people uh, with your work as well, and I appreciate you coming on, and I feel like this was a very good blend of people here discussing very uh, like-minded issues. Thank you. My pleasure.